Our scripture today is going to come from Luke chapter 10. Let me get open here. Verses 25 through 37. I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Hmm. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Just as I, uh, as I get going today, I, I, I want to actually start by, by taking a moment of, of personal privilege. So it's a, it's a very special day today. Um, my son Jackson turns 11 years old today. So, you know what, you know what, I, I'm the pastor of the church, I, I'm going to ask you to sing a happy birthday to him, okay? <laughs> Just because I can, so... He's right over here. We're going to say, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jackson. Happy birthday to you. Woo! All right, all right. Back to the sermon. <laughs> Hey, Phillips Island in Victoria, Australia, plays host to one of the greatest nature experiences that it's possible to see. On the shores of Phillip Island are the burrows of thousands upon thousands of fairy penguins, extraordinarily cute little birds that stand about 30 centimeters or so tall. Every morning, the adult penguins head out to sea to catch fish. And at the end of the day, they return to land to bring food back for their chicks. Watching them get from the water to their burrows is both funny and exhilarating. The penguins surf in on the waves. Then they gather in groups at the water's edge. Their burrows are about 100 meters or so away. And with the open of the sandy beach between them, all of a sudden, a group of penguins will take off, waddling as fast as their little legs will carry them across the beach. But then, having only gotten 10 or 20 meters across, they will suddenly turn and waddle back to the water. Then they wait. Then they try again. One group makes it. Another performs this strange uh, ritual of turning back. And on it goes through the dying light of day until finally the penguins have all crossed the beach and met their chicks in their burrows. Now what's going on? Why this strange stop-start-return ritual? Well, the answer is quite simple. At sea, the birds are fast swimmers. They are able to dive deep. At sea, they are safe from predators such as preying birds in the sky. In the burrows, they are safe below the ground, but on the open beach, well, there they are vulnerable. They are exposed. On the beach, they can only waddle slowly, and they are easy pickings for predators. 
And so as they cross the beach, the moment they see a shadow or something out of the corner of the eye, they turn back and they race for the safety of the water. Fear gets to them and it impacts their actions. I guess as human beings, we can relate too, right? Fear gets to us and it often then directs and impacts our actions. Last week, Pastor Drew opened up our new worship series based around our experiences of fear. He did that by calling us to lay claim to one of the most basic understandings of our faith, that God is with us and that God will never, ever leave us in anything. He looked at Psalm 27. He helped you remember those well-known words in the first verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Over the coming weeks, we're going to continue to think about fear. And more specifically, we're going to think about some of the fears that we experience in life. All of this is based on a book that we have a couple of classes running on, a book called Unafraid by Adam Hamilton. If you want to be a part of those classes, it's not too late to join in. We meet at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights, and we meet at 11.30 on Thursday mornings, all in the multi-purpose room. This week, however, I want to dive right in at the deep end, so to speak. And I want to speak to a fear that grips many of us. The fear of the other. What does that statement mean, fear of the other? Well, simply stated, to have a fear of the other means that there are individuals or people groups who, for better or worse, have been labeled by us or by the tribe that we belong to with the result that we become wary or anxious or fearful of being around those people or of having them included in our own lives. We fear what these others might do to us. We fear how their presence among us might impact us, our lives, our communities, those of our families. Yes, we seem to be a culture that is tightly held in the grip of fear of the other. Who might the other be? The answer to that could be different for many of us here. But my guess would be that if we were each to honestly and frankly list the groups of people whom we feel anxious about, our lists could potentially be long. Perhaps we would each of us start with a generic grouping about whom our fears might certainly be legitimate. Let's think about violent terrorists as a generic group. In the age in which we live, acts of violent terrorism seem to be reported more and more by news outlets. In the post-9-11 America that we live in, we might even go as far as to specifically name a group of violent terrorists, such as ISIS. That might be a group that we would fear or be anxious about. Perhaps there are those among us this morning who might take that just a step further and name Muslims in general as a group to be feared. Some people fear political conservatives and consider them a threat to progress, while others fear political liberals and say that they are the real threat. Some people fear immigrants to this nation for whom English is not their first language, while others have a fear of the alt-right, as it's known. Maybe it is the LGBTQ community and their allies that would make the list of those to be anxious about. For some here this morning, that group might definitely make your list. And for others, it's perhaps those who are labeled homophobic that would make it to a list of those that we are anxious and fearful of. Maybe a group is feared simply because of the color of their skin. Some of these people groups are feared because they, they pose a perceived immediate threat to our physical safety or that of our community. And in those circumstances, you know what? It is a legitimate fear, of course. Some of these groups are feared because they might one day take a seat of power and change things. Some of them are feared just because they are different. Some of them are feared just because they are unknown. They are feared because they occupy a space in life that is the opposite to the space that we occupy. 
this is hard to hear, it's because it's real. Whether we like it or not, fear of the other is part of our lives. It's part of my life. I put my hand up to it, and I'll confess it in front of you all today. In the Northern Ireland that I grew up in, our residential communities were divided along religious and political lines. Those areas that were loyal to the crown of the United Kingdom were marked by the proud flying of British flags and emblems. The curbstones of those areas were painted red and white and blue as a warning to all that passed through that the loyalties of this community were with the British. And on the other side, those communities loyal to the idea of a united Ireland, well, they flew Irish flags and emblems. They painted their curbstones green and white and orange to warn all who passed through that this was an area loyal to the Irish cause. I grew up on the side of the red and white and blue. And to this day, if I'm honest, when I go into those other areas, there is somewhere within my body an air of suspicion and fear of the other. To be more familiar and to speak in a language that you might understand, when I walk into one of those areas, I feel like the Florida Gator who got a ticket for the game with Florida State only to find out that it was in with all the Seminole fans. When our lives are gripped by a fear of the other, we develop unhealthy responses to that fear. We build bigger walls to keep the others out. We buy bigger guns and more weapons with which we can defend against the perceived threat of the other. We purchase enhanced security systems for our homes. We mount yet another camera as a deterrent to the threat of the other. We arm our teachers. We close ourselves off from others because they are different. We generalize the character of others based on the perceptions we hold about the people group that they belong to. We organize and we get out the vote. We take to social media to tear down the arguments of the other. We seek to humiliate and to bring the other down. So what are we to do with this? What are we to do with this fear of the other that we all seem to get caught up in in some way? Well, that's where we look to the example of Jesus. And we look to this most famous of parables of his, as it's told in Luke's gospel, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's the story of the lawyer who goes up to Jesus and asks him this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what's written in the law, Jesus asks. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength and all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. <sighs> well done, Jesus says. You're correct. Do this and you will live. Now honestly, the story should have stopped there. The lawyer asked the question. Jesus helped him get to the answer, which he already knew within himself. And the answer was as clear as it could have been. Love God and love others. To put it in terms that a lawyer might understand, this was an open and shut case. There was nothing more to be done. There was no need for further questions. But that never stopped a lawyer from having another question, right? In this story... Luke tells us that the lawyer wanted to justify himself. And so he asked that question, and who is my neighbor? Now, we are not privy to any information that helps us know exactly why the lawyer wants to justify himself, except that in the question that he asked, who is my neighbor? In asking a question like that, one can only assume that this lawyer wanted a clear definition of neighbor. And one can further assume then that this is because the lawyer prob probably had some neighbors that he was finding it hard to love. So Jesus tells him the story that we all know so well. In the telling of this story, Jesus is so very careful to use extreme characterizations of the people involved. The innocent man walking the road from Jericho to Jerusalem, who is set upon by robbers. They beat him to within an inch of his life, and they leave him for dead. But just as luck would have it, 
A priest is walking along the road just a short while later. I mean, who better to have come to your aid than a man of the cloth, right? I mean, me and Pastor Drew, you would want us in that kind of situation, right? Not in this case. The priest saw the man in distress, was overcome by fear, perhaps thinking that it was a setup, and he crossed over to the other side of the road and walked on by. Then a Levite comes along, again a supposedly good person who could hopefully be relied upon in the event of a situation like this. He also sees the beaten victim, senses a ruse, and crosses to the other side of the road, leaving the poor man to suffer. Finally, a Samaritan comes along the road. Now, out of all the people that Jesus could have used as one who might potentially help in this situation, the Samaritans were not it. Samaritans were the other. They were the ones to be suspicious of. They were the ones to be feared, the ones who you would be better to stay away from. These were the ones that you might expect to walk to the other side of the road and pass on by the man in trouble, but this one did not. Jesus has this one come to the victim's aid. He tends to his wounds. He lifts the man and puts him on his donkey and accompanies him to a local inn where he gets him a room and he takes care of him. The next day, he gives the innkeeper the equivalent of two full days' salary and asks him to tend to the man until he returns, when he will then recompense him for any more that he has had to spend. The Samaritan, the other, rushed to help. The Samaritan crossed social and religious boundaries to help. The Samaritan helped at personal expense of time and money. The Samaritan casts aside the perceived boundaries and fear of the other in order to do the right thing. And then Jesus asks the lawyer, which one do you think was a neighbor to him? The one who showed mercy, he said. And Jesus ended the conversation with the simple instruction, Go and do likewise. Friends, we live in an age and in a culture in which our suspicion and our fear of the other often leads us to being those who cross over to the other side of the road and walk on by. I'll hold up my hand and I will say that I have done it myself. We have arrived at a point at which we also have things to say back to Jesus in order to justify our fears and our suspicions of the other. But Jesus, don't you know who these people are? But Jesus, don't you know what they are like? But Jesus, didn't you hear about that time that they did this? But Jesus, don't you know how bad they are? But our relationship with Jesus beckons us, invites us not to be that way. The predominant phrase in Scripture, as Drew reminded us all last week, is do not be afraid. The promise of God is that God will always be with us, that God will never leave us nor forsake us in any time or in any place. The scripture reminds us that the one that is in us is greater than the one that is in the world. It reminds us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It reminds us that it is the perfect love of God that casts out all fear. The Samaritan on the road that day could have looked at the beaten man and decided that it was a staged situation designed to lure him to attack. It could have, he could have looked at the beaten man and decided that fear of the other would win that day. That he would pass on by on the other side of the road. But this is Jesus' story. And in Jesus' parable, he doesn't have him do that. Jesus has the Samaritan face those fears. Jesus has the Samaritan understanding that he is the neighbor of the beaten man. And so he rushed to help, casting aside the fear-filled assumptions of the society around him. The Samaritan rejected fear of the other in favor of being 
an agent of mercy instead. And we're called to do that too. I told you a little bit about what it's like to grow up in the divided society that I came from. One of the results of growing up in that place or in a divided society like it is that you begin to buy in to some of the rumors, to some of the untruths that are told about the other. You grew up thinking you know what every Roman Catholic in the world is like just because your mate Johnny told you something about them. It wasn't until I was older, until I met some of those Roman Catholics and those Irish nationalists and said, hey, what's your name? Hey, tell me your story. It wasn't until I sat down and had the coffee with them or I went and took a class with them that I began to understand that, you know what? They are just ordinary people living lives as best they can, by and large, so that they can get along just like I want to get along. So here's the challenge for the week, my friends. Do you remember that mental list we were creating at the start of the sermon? Of those people or people groups that, that give us anxiety or, or cause us to fear? Remember that list? We'll write it down this week. Think on it. And then take a little bit of action on it. Maybe call that person up. Say, hey, can we, can we go to lunch this week? Maybe call that person up and, and find out what the story is. Take a look at that list and choose not to let fear of the other win this week. Reach out to the other. Break down those walls of division that we have so carefully erected in this society and in our lives. Be that neighbor who will refuse the power of perceptions and fears. Move toward the other rather than give in to fear of the other because that is part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in this world. It's to seek out the other. It's to get to know the other. And the hope that by doing so, the light of Christ will shine within you and shine into the life of the other. That's the great hope of this world. That's the kingdom that Jesus came to announce and to enact. So you've got homework this week, church. Think of who the other is in your life and do your best to rise up and stand up and to go and to meet with them this week and to listen to their story. And then when you get the chance to tell yours, tell it too. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Would you please pray with me?